Thank you so much, Dr. Talsara. It's such an honor to be here today. Uh, when Dr. Talsara actually invited me uh, to uh, give a presentation on one of the UN SDGs, um, I, was, uh, I was elated because she trusted me to give justice to this very, very important topic, especially in these times when the whole world is suffering the pandemic and the education system has undergone a huge revolution. Um, kudos to all the teachers who have been in the front line uh, and they changed their teaching style overnight and um, more so uh, I will talk about other things in my presentation. So thank you again, Dr. Telsara, for trusting me to do this today and I hope I do justice to what you have um, asked me to do. So I'll now, um, uh, I will share my presentation. Uh, <clears throat> So my topic for today is equity and education, striving to make education accessible and equitable for all. I will be talking about two things. One of course is equity, diversity and inclusivity. And the other part of my presentation will talk about how the students can be made lifelong learners. I'm going by what the sustainable development goal of UN says. So I'll read it out for everybody's sake. It's goal number four, and it says ensure inclusive and equitable quality education. So that's one part. And it's equally important that we promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So I will be giving my suggestions how students can be made lifelong learners. At the same time, I will also be talking about how teachers can be and should be lifelong learners, because that is how they can be role models for their own students. It is, it'll be a message for administration as well, because they are the ones who are holding all the strings to promote lifelong learning for their teachers and for their students. So before we actually get into <clears throat> the presentation, I just wanted to go over some vocabulary here so that all of us are on the same plane of understanding what sustainability, equity, inclusivity means. Now, this meaning is from the dictionary. So it says, able to be maintained at a certain rate or level. Now, this is a very, very um, important um, uh, definition here because if you come to think of it, the education level has to be maintained at a certain level. It's, it does not mean that we have to stay where we are. It only means that we have to reach a certain level, which has been um, which has been assigned to us. However, we also have to think how to raise that level as an individual. I got this picture from the internet and I found it really interesting. If you see here, it's a chart actually which explains sustain. I want everybody to look at it only on the left side because that relates to our education system. So if you see support, keep alive and help. Now support is a very important term for uh, administration, for the teachers and also for the students. The second one is keep alive. We need to provide for, nourish and keep alive. And then help. We need to nurture everybody, relieve, assist, and foster learning in everybody. But why is it so important now? During the COVID season, I shouldn't call it a season, during the pandemic, every, every country has realized that there are disparities, not only in the education system, but at every level. And because of unemployment or other various reasons, it has widened the gap between communities. And that has had an effect on the education in children. Some of the children have got the ultimate uh, support and also facilities to learn almost like they were learning when the education was face to face. However, because of the lack of internet and technology, a lot of communities have 
not been able to do the same thing. And that has widened the gap. And that is not a good thing to happen for the future. Our children are our future and all of them should be treated the same. And this is why this discussion is so very important today. So today I will be talking about, like I said, about equity and inclusivity and also developing lifelong learners. What is equity and inclusivity? The quality of being fair and impartial to each student and to each teacher. So uh, Dr. Martin just mentioned women. And I'm so happy that he thinks about this and he also speaks about it because the students and teachers both are in the same, uh, they have to be treated equally at the same time. The gender equality also matters and inclusivity also matters. This is something I tweeted. I tweet a lot about education, physics, and also recently I've started talking about equity and inclusivity as well. So this, these are my own words. I said, being nice is not inclusivity. A lot of people think that if they're nice to uh, different kinds of uh, communities or people, that's inclusivity. Being kind, just being kind is not inclusivity. Diverse people in groups for optics is not inclusivity. So a lot of companies and a lot of uh, institutions are now hiring people from different groups, but that is not inclusivity. That is something like charity, and that can be uh, demeaning for some people. Inclusivity actually means mentoring everyone voluntarily to develop diverse leaders and acknowledging everybody's talent publicly. So whether it is a person uh, outside of educational institution or a teacher or a student in your class, they have to be acknowledged for their gifts or for their talents. This is another tweet that I actually uh, wrote some time back. Inclusivity is not doing something for others. So sometimes we think if you are doing something for some communities, we are including them. Inclusivity is about doing things with others. It is about listening, collaborating, respecting, and mentoring and many other things. And that is leadership. So leadership and inclusivity go hand in hand. Diversity, equity and inclusivity cannot happen with only action and words. It needs to change in the minds and hearts. And this is where we as educators come in the students' lives. We have to help them learn in a way that it changes their minds and the thinking. Because if their minds and hearts don't change, it is only a matter of time that the actions will follow those thoughts and feelings. So it has to come from the heart. It is not something that is only for show. So I will talk about what I have done in my class. It's one of the projects that I do with my grade 12 students. And because I teach AP physics and physics, uh, this is something that I have was thinking about it for a long time. And I started this project around, I would say around eight, nine years back, when I realized that I'm only teaching physics to students, and of course, they are doing a lot of work for, uh, from the outside world, connecting physics, but it's really sad that they never learn about the physicists. They don't know who gave them all the knowledge that they are learning in my class. More than that, they never come to know the physicists from their own country. And the reason that's important for me as a teacher, because in my school, I have students from 48 different countries coming to study there. So if what we teach actually in our classes in North America is only Western science, we never give credit to anybody who's outside of North America or even Europe. And that is something that might not instill um, pride in students who are not from these areas. And that is when I started thinking about doing something that 
two goals are met. The first goal was talking about physicists and helping them learn. And secondly, choosing a physicist, not necessarily, but preferably coming from their own country. And they should not know just not just about their work, but also their lives. And the students were told that they will not talk about physicists who are already very famous, like Einstein and Planck and Bohr. They should talk about physicists who are not very well known, although they have done great work for this world. So what the students do is they look for physicists and they feel very, very good about this. And they feel really proud when they find out that a physicist is from a country who has given so much to the scientific world and also social, economic and sustainable uh, uh, process in, this, uh, in the communities. Whether you believe it or not, one of my students actually visited the university of where the physicist for whom he was uh, doing the project uh, uh, for this, uh, for the class, uh, he actually visited the university and spoke with people who knew the physicist. So he went back to Turkey uh, for his holiday and that's when he did that. And these are the things that really make me so happy because the student was so proud talking about the physicist, about his country, about the university in his country. And I will tell you one more instant. And the reason I'm talking in so much detail about this project, because it's not something difficult to do. I always like to talk about things that are easy for teachers to do in their classes, not very difficult. And I'm always willing to share the details of the project if somebody is interested. I will give you another example. I had two students in my class. One was originally, originally uh, he was from in, like he's from the Indian origin, and the other one was British origin. And when Higgs boson was discovered and Higgs got the Nobel Prize, he did not mention Satyendranath Bose after whose name the boson was actually was named. Einstein and Fermi gave that particle name boson because Satyendranath Bose from India had uh, hypothesized it. And because they have to talk about the ethical things in this project, this was one of the things that struck them. <clears throat> so both the friends, actually one of them became Satyendranath Bose and made the video talking about his life, his work, and all the achievements that he had. And the student who was of the British origin talks about Higgs and also about the ethics piece that, um, that uh, was uh, uh, talked about. He discussed it that uh, Higgs should have mentioned Satyendranath Bose's name in his speech because if Bose hadn't hypothesized the particle, nobody would have been looking at it. So you can also do the same thing. All the teachers can also do the same thing in their classes uh, for the subject that they teach. The second thing I wanted to talk about is uh, if we are talking about equity, we should not differentiate between our students. Most schools have a program or programs that Students, some of the students are called gifted. We also do the same thing. We say, oh, the student is very intelligent. The student is gifted. And most of the time, that's based only on academics. As educators, we have to remember that each person in this world has a unique superpower which needs to be discovered. And that is the educational institution or the teacher's duty to discover, do, do that. Schools have a responsibility to help every teacher and student discover their gift. And I would like everybody to think about this. How many of us have been doing that? And that includes me as well. But this is something I thought about uh, some time back, and that's why I tweeted about this. So this is also one of my tweets uh, on Twitter, because when I read people talking about gifted, it is not having a good influence on the other students around them. Of course, we need to applaud, but we need to applaud, but at, and at the same time, try to find out how we can applaud the other student for his or her own gifts. 
And the biggest reason for that is there is no one perfect way to be a good teacher because everybody is unique and every situation is also unique. And I'm adding the word student also here because every teacher and student have different challenges, different skills and abilities, and certainly different backgrounds. So what matters is that a teacher loves her students and does the very best every single day to help them discover their own talents and gifts. So this is what the admin can do and the teachers can do. Be supportive during their times of their challenges. So in case a student is not doing very well in your class, there must be a reason. And I have discovered that more than once, uh, that if a student is not succeeding, there is always a background story. Provide resources for their well-being. And if that is, if they have face facing a challenge, please provide resources for their well-being and be generous. And for teachers, please encourage professional development. And I talk about that in every presentation that I give, because unless the teachers are developing themselves, the students cannot develop themselves because they need to come in with stories, with resources from outside and give those to their um, students in class. <clears throat> because when one finds the niche, and whether it's a teacher and a student, and I'll keep reminding everybody that, when a teacher or a student finds the niche and gets an opportunity, they excel. So please help them discover and excel. And please be fair. So the admin should give opportunities to teachers, not just for professional development, but networking, training, and academic freedom. What has to be taught in class is normally standardized from the government or the school boards. However, how it is taught in the classes is a teacher's, uh, teacher has to decide that. And that academic freedom is crucial for innovation in classes. For students, give them opportunities in science, art, athletics, etc., cross-curricular activities within the school or outside of school, and mentors from inside and outside of school. My students, when they work on my project in physics, which is called Everything is About Physics, that is one of the criteria that they have because they are not talking about something that's already on the internet. It is something that it is their question, and I call it their PhD thesis because they start with their own question, whether they are relating economics or sports or medical with physics, and they have to connect with experts inside and outside of school. And that gives them that training of networking that I was just talking about. It becomes a cross-curricular activity in the sense that they're talking about anything under the sky and connecting it with physics. Now, when I talk about science, arts, and athletics, it might not be possible in schools who are not that, as I call them, rich. And that is where the equity falls apart. So even if those facilities are not there in the schools, teachers and admin and maybe some experts from outside need to volunteer the time to think about how this can be done without spending too much money. Because it is possible, but the only thing that will be uh, required here is a lot of uh, support and volunteerism from part of the adults in the school. It's not the easiest thing, but one can always try and make it a little better in the beginning and then keep raising the level every year. So let's now come back to the current situation and think about what has happened and try to look at the bright side. Because it has been a huge paradigm shift for individuals at home or industry, government, countries, and most of all, what we are talking about in education today. 
So the next part points of the next part of my presentation are points for discussion for actions from administration, teachers, and also parents. <clears throat> So teachers, be ready to transform. Admin, be ready to transform. Don't let your progress hinder in your progress. And I say this in every presentation of mine. It is a quote from my son, and some people might have already heard this. He was doing a startup. He was starting his own work. And I told him his work, his job is going so well. So why should he leave his job and do something from scratch? And this was his answer. He said, I don't want my progress hinder in my progress. And the reason I talk about this to teachers and administration is because sometimes we think, oh, our school is doing so well. I'm doing so well in my class. My students are learning so well. So we are progressing well. So I will not change. But please remember, unless you hinder your progress, your current progress, you cannot pro pro progress in the larger life. So administration, please give some retreat to the teachers, maybe an hour a day or two hours a week. Let them think on their own. Give them that rest out of their working hours, mental and physical, because whenever people are thinking in their own time, that is when they think of innovative ideas because they need to get away from regular thinking and actions more so now. In today's situation, it's so important for pedagogical and for technology reasons. And we need to plan and think from scratch. So they need the time to do that. So don't overburden them with a lot of work. Let them relax and think about how they can make their teaching style better. For the teachers, who are we now? I'm talking to the educators now. Knowledge is available freely everywhere, and each one of us is aware of that. And when I was writing um, a unit in a textbook around uh, maybe 10 years or 13 years back, the publisher, the first thing the publisher told us is this will be the last textbook written because the revolution in the internet knowledge had already uh, dawned and people could with the Khan Academy and so many other platforms people can learn for free so then I started asking myself I said am I a curriculum deliverer or a knowledge giver or a test taker I said okay knowledge curriculum is freely available like I just mentioned so we must be the bridge between what the students are learning on their own and what is credible. As educators, we are very aware that a lot of information on the internet is not credible. So we have to be there when the students are learning or when they come and say something in our classes about the curriculum. We have to make sure that they have learned correctly. So that is our duty now. So let them talk about what they have learned. Let them talk about the knowledge they have acquired and make sure that they learn correctly once you have critiqued it. And you cannot imagine how much difference that can make in the interest and the engagement of students in the class when they become their owners, become uh, owners of their own learning. And, you, and they know that there is support in the class and there's a teacher who will always guide them in the right way. The other part of it is, again, during the pandemic, all of us have learned that, that we are all learners. Every school is a school of learners now. It is no longer about teachers and learners. The three important traits that would be required, and there are many more, but I'm talking about the top three, courage, resilience, and patience. Courage, I've been talking about courage for, a, for almost ever. Um, and with pandemic, we know that resilience is also important. And of course, patience is the virtue of every teacher and every parent. 
So administration, I said I will be talking to you about some of the ways. So please plan, plan for sabbatical days, hours, enough time to reflect and plan. And those in my space times are best for thinking and creating and best ideas are developed during these times. Please be flexible with your teachers. Give them academic freedom and trust. And I talked about this. I just wanted to re-emphasize on these very important things and trust them. Whether um, the teacher wants to try something new, please trust them. And the reason why as administrators, we should trust our teachers and as teachers, we should trust our students is because we have to let them take risks. I cannot stress this enough. If you think of any big thing that has happened in this world, it is only and only because someone, an individual, dared to take that risk. Look at all the big technology companies. Look at all the discoveries and inventions that have happened. People took risk, and that is why we have what they created. Creativity and innovation happen when people take risk and fear of making mistakes is natural, but it is the only way of learning and becoming the ocean. And why I said ocean is, I want all of you to look at the poem from uh, Khalil Gibran on right, and I will be reading the last uh, verse there. The river needs to take the risk of and I hope everybody can see that and make it just a little bigger. The river needs to take risk of entering the ocean because only then will fear disappear because that's where the river will know it's not about disappearing into the ocean but becoming the ocean. And that is what our students need to do. They need to become the ocean and not fear that they will be, be uh, entering the ocean. <clears throat> so what happens when we are entering this ocean or taking a risk? I would like everybody to look at the picture on the right and I'll give you a moment to have a look at it and then I will talk about it. And think about if somebody starts swimming as well. So when somebody wants to dive in a swimming pool or take a risk in general in life, they are always in a fear zone. And of course, that's really natural for any human being. When they overcome, overcome their fear, they start learning. They learn from their mistakes. They learn from their experiences and they learn to go forward. And when that happens, the ultimate level of growth zone is reached. We can do it this in our classes in a very short way or a small way, but we have to think about its important in, importance in life. So once the person is in the learning zone, confidence will take us to the growth zone. Be flexible when students are taking risks. Give them, instill courage in them, and that is when innovation will happen. And teachers, people say that think, as, think outside the box. I don't believe in thinking outside of the box. I believe in thinking as if there is no box at all. And this statement is so true during the pandemic because each educator has had to do that. We've had to think as if there's nothing, there's no classroom, there are no desks and chairs, there is no whiteboard or blackboard. The only thing we have is a laptop screen. So the box that we knew has disappeared. Our box is gone. There is no box and we have to think from the scratch. So support for the teachers now. Please, teachers, never compete with anyone but yourself. So if you want to become better, don't try to compete with anybody. The only thing you should compete about where you are and where you want to be. 
because insecurities bring breed competition and competition breeds insecurities it should be a cooperation like i say it the people should be cooperating to help everyone succeed learn from everyone but think on your own another of my favorite quotes if you are thinking like everyone else you aren't thinking so be innovative i that is why the fashion following in education and fashion following for educational technology is not the best thing well being educational technology pedagogy and assessments these are the four things i'll be touching upon to go to my next stage of the presentation where i will be talking about strategies so that students can you can give quality education to help students become lifelong learners talking about educational pedagogy and i'm combining pedagogy and technology here because they are so uh, dependent on each other these days use educational technology if and only if improve it improves pedagogy and learning so i'll briefly explain what i want to say here a lot of teachers think okay this technology is available so i should use it in my classes that is not the correct approach you should first think about what you want to do in class does that project mean uh, mean any have uh, has any pedagogical um, uh, benefit and then look for the tool the technology tool that serves the best for that particular pedagogy and project because it is never about how many or which tool you use but how you use them so try to find innovative ways to use technology tools that you already have because what happens is if you try to run behind different technology tools every day or every week it will overwhelm you and then if you sit in the student's chair can you imagine the student's mind or the the uh, the burden that is has it has on the students uh, brain because not only that not only they have to learn the curriculum that you're trying to help them learn they also have to deal with the technology although they are very good with dealing with any technology but this is a big distraction then for them so using too many diverse tools does not improve your pedagogy it only overwhelms you and your students so think hard before you start thinking about oh those teachers are using this technology so i should also use it that is not the best approach what is learning now so learning with fun we always say we want our students to uh, learning with fun but please remember a lot of teachers and educators and even some maybe myself some years back thought that if the student is dancing and singing that is when they are having fun but i have realized uh, for a long time now that if somebody gives me a calculus or a physics um, uh, problems to solve i am very happy and i am learning with fun and that is when i realized that students who are quiet in the class and i'm coming to the equity part now again because in our classes there are students who are quiet or some are active and some are very talkative but we shouldn't think that the quiet students are not having fun in your class because they must be just enjoying doing the work that you're giving them learning with fun is about engagement and that could be a very quiet situation if the assignment seems purposeful to the students whether you are online or face to face in a classroom so try to make all the assessments on the all the assignments very very meaningful for the students very purposeful so tell them what the purpose is feel free to do that in your classes you can tell them i am giving this project because i think that this is what how it will benefit you show them the power of the purpose and not just the assessment 
And then students will make mistakes. We make mistakes. Don't punish them for their mistakes. Teach them that they can learn from them. And this is why I will be talking to you about tests also um, later in the presentation. Mistake, making a mistake is human. Learning from them is what is important. So help them not feel guilty if they make a mistake in your classes. Let them take risks, make mistakes. Let them have courage to do these things. And teachers should be role model too. In my class, I always remind students that there are no wrong answers. And again, if, if there is a wrong answer, maybe when I tell them the correct answer, they will never forget it. Help them feel confident to express their awe and ask questions. Unless they are confident in your class, they can never ask questions. So first step is make them feel confident that they can take risks. They can make mistakes. Also show them that you make mistakes. So if I make a mistake in anything that I do in my class, I always thank them. And actually it's a joke in the class that I love when my students tell me when I've made a mistake because then I'm sure they were paying attention. So tell them that in a positive way. Tell them you want them to point out your mistakes because then you are sure that they were listening to you. They were trying to stay engaged in what you were talking about. It's not the easiest thing to do for a teacher uh, that students tell them they are making a mistake, but I think it is a very important thing uh, for us to do. Again, going back to what I said earlier, you need courage and have that. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, change the meaning of success, please. Because we always think that if somebody is winning, that is when they are succeeding. But real success is developing champions for our world, whether they win or lose. And this is from a TED Talk. If you're interested, I can share the link with you. It's a, it's a fantastic TED Talk from uh, Valerie Candos. I talked about global leaders. Uh, global leaders are lifelong learners. So in, when you are making your students lifelong learners, they are on the path to become global leaders. And these are the things that I talked about in my previous presentation. And um, I will not go through all the details here. I will just show them to you to remind you that each of these criteria are very important. In one morning, actually, I was just thinking about uh, my classes, my students, like all of us do all the time. And I, all of us hear this, prepare your students for the real world, prepare your students for the real world, which is true. But I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we prepared them to make this world happier and more beautiful? All the time we are saying, okay, this is the real world. We are giving it to you in a plate. Prepare yourself for that plate. That is not making them lifelong learners because they are only striving to achieve what's already out there. You want them to change for the better what is already out there. Change for the better, making the world happier, making the world more beautiful, sustainable, and equitable for all. World would be happier if everybody is included. World will be happier if we are more tolerant. So that is what we need to prepare them in our classes. I read this on LinkedIn um, and the link is there. If you want, you can go and see. The purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. And this is how our assessment should be. I'll let you think for a moment about this. It is not to prove that a student is not good or good in your subject, but it is should be about to improve the student in your subject. And there comes a time when we need to just, and this is a quote from Desdemon Tutu. Uh, he says, there comes a time when we need to stop pulling people out of the river 
That's what we keep doing in our classes. We say, okay, this student is weak, pull him out and put him somewhere else or her somewhere else. What we as educators need to do, we need to go upstream at the beginning of, of where we started and find out why they are falling in, why they are not succeeding. That should be part of our duty. So when we are creating our own assessments, we create assessments to assess learning, but do we ever assess our own assessments? How do we know what we are doing is the right thing to do? Are we giving them tools? Are we building tools to help students assess their own learning and without us being judgmental? Education should be just about learning and not about marks. And this is something I believe in 200%. In my classes, I have seen that enthusiasm is demonstrated whenever I give them a task which is not marked. In my club, my students do really high level science projects. They connect with scientific uh, experts. They experiment on the uh, synchrotron. There are no marks in that project. They have published a paper. One of the groups has published a paper. But you should see their enthusiasm throughout the year. They spent hours on this project. They don't get any certificate. They don't get anything. They, the only thing that the, this project does for them is that they learn and learn not the science, but a lot of other things uh, that are involved uh, in the project. So it should not be about marks. Think about what we want the students to learn before we decide what we want to teach them. So we have to go backwards now. And where, while preparing lessons, Think about how to discuss the topic and not be there just to impart the knowledge. Consider motivation and purpose before creating the assessment. And of course, I talked about this earlier, pedagogical reasons before choosing a technology and encourage inquiry. Let them ask questions rather than we asking them questions. Understand that the students, especially those in senior classes, are stressed. Be flexible. Continue to remind yourself that testing is not the way, only way to assess. Explore alternate methods to do that. Think about why we give tests. What is in them for students? I strongly feel that tests only makes a database for us. I doubt it does anything for the students. The students are really scared of tests and exam, as we all have experienced. But they are not intimidated by the tests and exams. They are intimidated and scared of our judgment. The judgment from their teachers, their parents, their classmates, and the community in general. So please, Kindness is so needed for students. Please don't, we have to stop being judgmental by giving them tests and exams. Have faith in their abilities. That is what will keep them and you going. Be grateful because that is really crucial for mental health and positivity. Resilience, courage and effort, we know that are important. But integrity is most important. Politeness, we have to make our students learn to be polite and be generous and be grateful and have faith in themselves. So not just us, we need our students to learn these same things. And of course, be kind to yourself. Trust yourself. Know that you will do your best and believe that it will be okay. Thank you. I will invite questions now. <clears throat>